Okay. Yay. I'm so excited. Thanks everyone for tuning in. My name is Rosie from EcoCycle. Um, I'm uh, recording live from my bedroom. So you just met my cat turtle. There's someone using a power tool outside my window. So I hope you can't hear that. <laughs> it was really good timing. Um, but I'm excited to do our very first digital um, eco-leader training. This has turned into um, a little bit more expanded than the regular eco-leader trainings because you don't have to show up. You could just um, tune in. So it looks like a lot of people um, from outside our normal network are here. So I give eco-leader trainings in person usually every month when we can meet each other in person. Um, and so this time we just decided to do it digitally so that we didn't have to skip out on connecting and learning new things. So. If you're interested in being an eco-leader, it's a really great program where you can meet like-minded people and learn more about the environment and sustainability and how you can help. Um, and I will send out a follow-up email to everybody that re registered for this event um, with information on how to sign up to be an eco-leader. And I'll also send out um, a link to our upcoming video series, which I'll talk about at the end, and a link to this video because um, we're recording it. And so then we can have it um, as an actual video after we're done doing it live. So, um, yay. So thanks so much for tuning in. It's a very special day today. Today is Earth Day, and not only that, it is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So we've been celebrating Earth Day since 1970, and here we are today in 2020. Um, so this is such a big deal to me and us, and I'm sure to most of you since you're here. And while this huge anniversary is getting a little overshadowed by current circumstances, I'm so grateful that we have so many people who are still working hard on environmental and climate issues, um, hopefully from home. This is a really exciting new training that I've been working on um, with my friends at EcoCycle. And it's about the impacts and processes of materials before we ever see them as products. So a lot of us in the recycling world and people who care about recycling and zero waste really tend to um, focus entirely on the downstream part of these materials life cycles. So looking at the product after we've used it and determining whether it's recyclable or compostable or um, trash, but we often miss the big upstream phase of a product's life cycle before we even see it since it's a lot less visible, but it's also very important. Um, okay, so um, we're going to move on to our first slide. <laughs> Ari's working the mouse for me. So we are teaming up. This is a team effort. Yeah, sorry. It's um, for some reason when I click next. Oh, there we go. OK, cool. All right. So <laughs> <laughs> we have a really attractive picture of me on our first slide, just to kick things off nice and strong. Um, so because um, we haven't done a Zoom, uh, training before. Some people might not know how it works. And also this is different than a normal Zoom call. So normally when you call into Zoom, um, you can hear and see each other like Ari and I can hear each other. Um, but this is a webinar style Zoom. So that means that I can't hear or see any of you guys. You don't have microphone or um, video on you, but we can still interact in real time. So you can um, click the Q&A button, which is <laughs> a little circle where I'm pointing. Um, in the picture, um, you can press the Q&A button and you can submit your questions. Um, and then Ari will be keeping an eye on these questions um, while I present and we'll look at them at the end too. And so then the end we'll go through um, as many as we can and get your questions answered. I think the presentation part of, <laughs> of this um, training will just be about an hour, hopefully. Um, I hope to not talk too fast because I tend to do that. And so then we should have plenty of time for questions. Um, Marty just said, when do I get pizza? Because I usually give you guys pizza at these trainings, but I hope you're enjoying some sort of pizza in the comfort of your own home. Okay, so let's get started on the actual training. There's like cat hair floating in my room. Great, okay. So um, before we get started on the actual content of this training, I just wanted to give a quick background about EcoCycle so you know your source for all this information since, like I said, a lot of people are tuning in that might, might not have attended um, trainings before or really been familiar with EcoCycle and our work. Um, so EcoCycle is one of the largest nonprofit recyclers in the U.S. and we have an international reputation as a pioneer and innovator of resource conservation. We were established in 1976 by everyday residents. So you actually heard some of the people in the little chat room saying that they were on the original school buses, um, they were driving the buses, things like that, that was them. 
Um, so we were established in 76 by everyday residents who had a passionate belief in conserving our natural resources. These EcoCycle volunteers brought recycling to Colorado in 1976 in these old school buses, iconic, making Boulder one of the first 20 communities in the US to offer curbside recycling. We continue to be driven by these same passions and innovative actions. We are the recycler for Boulder County, so that means we operate the Boulder County Recycling Center, as well as the Center for Hard to Recycle Materials, or CHARM. And we do outreach and advocacy programs in every sector of the community, so neighborhoods, schools, events, governments, and or government and businesses. EcoCycle is amazing overall, and I'm really proud to work for them. So that's a quick spiel just about um, who we are, so you know. <laughs> where your uh, information is coming from, but you can learn a lot more on our website. Okay, let's get started on this actual training. So this training is called, what is it called? The Real Footprint of Our Stuff, How Resources Become Products and Their Upstream Impacts. So all of our stuff, our bottles, cans, bags, electronics, cars, all of it comes from the earth. They're literally a piece of our planet, even though we don't tend to think about them like that. So one of the reasons that this planet is so amazing and provides us with the perfect conditions for life is that it's ripe with natural resources that we've used to make some really cool stuff. Our natural resources have been turned into life-changing technologies, medicines, and more, thanks to our human creativity and ingenuity. The thing to keep in mind, though, is that these resources are finite. It may seem like we'll never run out since we've been using them for so long, but we've been mining and using these resources at a much faster rate these days than we ever have before, beginning in the Industrial Revolution and exponentially speeding up until today. So when we think, really think about how precious these resources are, it's pretty absurd to think that we're using them to make things like a plastic fork, also wrapped in plastic, that took literally millions of years to create but will be used for like a minute and then thrown away. Or the nine paper napkins that you didn't ask for but then you get them anyway <laughs> when you go to get takeout food. Oh, this said, please speak a little slower. Yeah, I always, I always talk fast. Um, and yeah, I'll send this out again so you can see it again, but thank you for <laughs> the feedback. I always like get excited and then talk really fast. Okay, um, so these are all precious pieces of the earth that we can't return to the earth. So while I'm not advocating that we just go back to the stone age and stop using resources altogether, when we know where these materials come from and how much impact the process to extract them um, has on the earth, we might evaluate our choices as well as our systems and reconsider practicing practices prioritizing convenience over the use of finite resources and turning precious and finite natural resources into single use products. <laughs> if we really step back and look at our planet like aliens visiting earth for the first time, we might conclude that the humans on this planet are one crayon short of a box to put it nicely. So this is a little cartoon that says, I've got no luck on finding any signs of intelligent life. How about you? And he says, nope, he's looking at our trash. So it's pretty, if you really like step back and kind of disassociate with, with our convenience culture, it seems pretty obscene that we're taking these precious natural resources and turn, turning them into like a straw that you didn't even want in the first place. And then you throw it in the landfill and then make it again. So that's kind of the beginning of our overview. Um, lots of times, when we're looking at different products and packaging, environmentalists like ourselves figure out if it's recyclable and if it is, we think we're golden. Um, but when you go beyond the question of recyclability and consider where these materials come from and what they went through before you ever saw them on the shelf, it might lead us to decide that skipping the product altogether is the best option, whether or not it's recyclable. So recyclable isn't the be on end all. It's really once you know um, what it's made of and what it took to get there, um, you may decide that even if it's recyclable, you should skip it if you can. So we're going to go um, through the materials one by one so we can learn about where they come from um, and what it takes to turn them into the products that we recognize. So we're going to start with our friend aluminum. We find aluminum commonly in beverage cans, catering, and to-go containers, and lots of building materials. Oh, I'm like out of breath. <laughs> Sitting and talking is really hard work. Okay, so the principal ore of alumina is bauxite. So bauxite is a re residual rock formed from, the formed from the weathering of various igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks. In order for these rocks to weather that much, they either have to be exposed to long, long periods like millions of years of weathering or be exposed to very wet tropical conditions. 
So because of that, we get our bauxite almost, almost exclusively from the tropics. 90% of the known bauxite resources are in tropical locations. So the greatest concentrations of bauxite are in Central and South America, in West Africa, in particular Guinea, um, and then India, Vietnam, and Australia. So as folks who care about the environment, we know that the tropics are so crucial for us to preserve. It's not only the most precious source of biodiversity on the planet, but it also provides essential ecosystem services like carbon sequestration, meaning actually taking the CO2 that's in the atmosphere and storing it in the ground, um, and oxygen production, of course. So we really need to preserve the tropics and we'd like to not cut them down as much as we can. Okay, so this is a video showing bauxite mining. So we can see that we've taken our precious tropical rainforest and strip mined it to expose and extract bauxite. So I'll talk about that mining process in just a second, but this is um, like a fly overview of a, of a bauxite um, mining site. So you can see that there's all these green lush trees all around and then a big old hole in it where we scraped off <laughs> the surface. So that leads me to the extraction process. So first, uh, the first step is to clear cut. So that means cutting down all those valuable tropical trees um, and clearing vegetation, often slashing and burning. And we're not fans of that as <laughs> an environmental organization. Um, wide swaths of habitat are destroyed as is the ability of the forest to moderate local weather patterns, moisture and CO2 levels. So that's not the best. Um, bauxite, as you just saw, is strip mined. So that means that they essentially scrape off the topsoil and leave everything underneath exposed to erosion and pollution. So the now bare earth underneath um, pours mud into the rivers with every rainstorm, water supplies are no longer usable for local people, um, and the local communities are often devastated, which I'll talk about actually in the next slide. Um, they do do some blasting, like you can see here, if there are some parts of ore that can't be dug easily. This involves drilling and placing explosives or ripping with large bulldozers. So then they load the ore onto trucks and haul it to a crushing facility. The trucks range in size from 30 to 180 tons. So big trucks. Um, so if done responsibly, a next step would be landscaping and rehabilitating that land back to the existing land use in, land use in collaboration with the local people and, and government. Um, but you really can't recreate the kind of biodiversity that there originally was before. You can kind of reforest, but old growth isn't the same as new growth and you can't really like return all the biodiversity, all the animals and ecosystem services that existed there before. Um, and efforts like that aren't super common in most um, parts of the world where they're bauxite mining anyway. So ugh, kind of irreversible. Um, from there, they go to the crushing facility. At the crushing facility, the ore is crushed and sorted and then washed and taken to a refinery to get turned into alumina. So I just described so much stuff and we're not even like halfway through <laughs> the process to turn bauxite into aluminum. So already we made such a big impact on the planet and I'm not even, I still have to talk so much more about aluminum. <laughs> so the next slide is really a bummer. Um, so while there is tremendous environmental devastation, there are also significant social justice issues ex associated with ex extraction. Ooh, wow. I had trouble with that sentence. I'm gonna say it again. While there is tremendous environmental devastation, there is also significant social justice issues associated with the extraction of bauxite. So this slide here is from the Human Rights Watch and it's about bauxite mining, mining in Guinea um, and its impact on the people there. So I'm just gonna read the text that's there. The Bouquet region in Northwestern Guinea has been the center of much of the bauxite sector's recent growth. The region now has dozens of open sky bauxite quarries whose red earth makes them hard to miss in Guinea's often verdant lamps landscape. Mining companies use heavy machinery to remove any earth covering the bauxite and dynamite blasting to break up the ore found underneath. A network of mining roads and railways used to transport bauxite to ports crisscross once, isol once isolated rural communities. Industrial ports where bauxite is loaded onto barges or ships for export are juxtaposed with the mangroves, paddy fields, and local fishing ports that form the backbone of Riverside communities' livelihoods. Mining companies take advantage of the ambiguous protection for rural land rights in Guinean law to expropriate, expropriate ancestral farmlands without adequate compensation or for financial payments that cannot replace the benefits communities derive from land. 
damage to water sources that residents attribute to mining, as well as increased demand due to the population migration to mining sites, reduces communities access to water for drinking, washing, and cooking. Women, who are primarily responsible for fetching water, are forced to walk longer distances or wait for long periods of time to obtain water from alternative sources. The dust produced by bauxite mining and transport smothers fields and enters homes, leaving families and health workers worried that reduced air quality threatens their health and environment. Ugh. So that was a lot. Um, I don't want to like bog us down with things that are depressing because it's a really hard time to keep it together emotionally anyway. Um, but I just want to really focus on um, being comprehensive in our approach about this because I think, you know, we can talk all day about environmental impact um, of just pretty much any given process, but it's really important to include environmental justice um, when we're talking about environmentalism because it's one thing to cut down our trees, but um, it's also really important to look at how it's impacting local people and especially indigenous people. Okay, so um, the refining process of bauxite is next. So most of the aluminum in the US is refined in Iceland. So that means that the bauxite is mined in the tropics and then sent all the way up to Iceland and then distributed back down to us. So I made a little map showing where it goes because it's, it's just all over the place. Um, the reason that it's mostly refined in Iceland is because um, hydropower is cheap there. Um, so hydropower makes up 19% of the fuel profile for aluminum cans specifically, but it's only 1% of the fuel profiles for glass and PETE bottles. So that's why the aluminum, the bauxite is going up there to become aluminum. So on this map, you can see how far it has to travel to get to us, which in itself is a huge impact, even if we hadn't just learned about all the other um, impacts, all the mining impacts. But wait, there's still more. Okay, so <laughs> we have the bauxite. We sent it up to Iceland. The bauxite, the bauxite then has to be refined into alumina, which is a process called the Bayer method. So this method was invented by Carl Bayer in 1887, and it uses sodium hydroxide to selectively dissolve the aluminum oxides. This produces a sodium aluminum solution from which pure aluminum hydroxide is precipitated later to be calcined to produce oxide from which the metal is recovered. This part is a little dry if you're not a chemist. I obviously just had to read that because <laughs> I don't, um, I can't fluently speak like that. So I'm just gonna run through the basic steps of what happens um, of what I wrote on this slide. So first, there's a wet grinding of bauxite into a fine slurry and then digestion of the slurry by caustic soda under extremely high pressure and temperature. So when I'm talking about all of these processes of all of these materials, you'll hear me say high pressures and temperatures a lot, and that should trigger like lots of energy. We're using a lot of energy um, when we have to make these high pressure, high temperature environments. So then there's a separation and washing of insoluble residues termed sand and mud um, from the process solution, which is they call green liquor. And then there's a crystallization, precipitation, of aluminum trihydrate from the sodium aluminate, and then a calcination of the aluminum trihydrate crystals at approximately 1,832 degrees Fahrenheit, which I don't even know how hot that is. That's really up there. Um, and that's where we get alumina. So you can see if you look at this little graph that alumina is one of the products because that's what we're going for. But then another product of this process is red mud. So um, it's a, that's a highly caustic sort of like sludge, and it's really hard to deal with and dispose of. It can be neutralized um, through a process using seawater, um, but um, it is really tricky <laughs> and it does cause a lot of pollution in a lot of cases. So the statistic is that every ton of new aluminum cans that must be produced to replace cans that were not recycled so every time we make a ton of cans from virgin bauxite, like we're talking about here, um, it creates about five tons of caustic mud, which is so much, that can contaminate both surface water and groundwater and in turn damage the health of people and animals. So that's, that's another um, <laughs> thing to worry about. We're not worried about enough in this process yet. Okay, and then, okay. We're not even done with bauxite here. This is a really long process if you haven't noticed. So we went through, so we have the bauxite. We sent it up to, um, to Iceland. From there, it went through the Bayer method. So it went 
bauxite into alumina. And now we have to take the alumina and turn it into aluminum, which is what we recognize as something like a, an aluminum can. So we need to smelt it into aluminum. So alumina is smelted into aluminum through another process called the hall herolt process. And I will read those slides now. <laughs> I really tried to like whittle it down so that I wouldn't just be spewing um, chemist jargon this whole presentation. Um, but I do think this one is really interesting actually. So the aluminum is produced by extracting it from the aluminum oxide through an electrolysis process driven by an electrical current. So that's more energy. Um, th so the process uses cryolite, which is like this bath, which is capable of dissolving the alumina. So the carbon anodes are immersed into the cryolite, the bath, carrying an electrical current, which then flows through the molten cryolite containing dissolved alumina. As a result, the chemical bond between the aluminum and oxygen in the alumina is broken and the alumina is deposited into the bottom of the cell. So this one is also really interesting. I did a lot of research on this one um, and it's, I found out that it's really cool. So a guy named Hall, his last name was Hall in the United States and a guy named Herald in France. They were both 22 years old at the time. And coincidentally in 1886, they both, both 22 year olds on opposite sides of the country or of the world, not that they're not the same country, <laughs> uh, US, France, um, they both applied for patents for the exact same process at the exact same time at the age of 22. So they both found at the same time on opposite sides of the world that if you use an electrical current in a bath, which is cryolite, you can smelt alumina into aluminum, which is pretty specific. That's a pretty specific thing to figure out at the same time. Um, <laughs> but again, it uses a lot of energy. Um, and that is the final step in creating aluminum. So we finally got bauxite into aluminum. <sighs> I'm out of breath just describing that process. So um, why recycling it makes sense. So this one is kind of the poster child for why recycling makes sense because there's such a huge um, upstream impact and such a long process to get it into alumina. So the more we can avoid that process, the better. So aluminum production in the United States generally takes two forms, so with very different energy requirements. Primary production is one of them, and that means that making, that, that means making aluminum directly from bauxite, uh, which is the whole process that we just talked about. So it's a virgin product. We made it from the bauxite ore, and we turned it into aluminum via that whole process that I just described. So it's highly energy intensive. I talked, again, a lot about in energy um, use and, um, and high temperatures and things like that. Um, plus there's just so many freaking steps involved. Um, so secondary production, meaning using recycled aluminum scraps to form new products. So we already have aluminum and then we just make it into a different aluminum product or a new aluminum product is a significantly less energy intensive process um, because we don't have to go through all of that. Um, and it requires a lot less energy um, and electricity to turn it into a can once it's already aluminum. Or I keep saying can, but it can be whatever product. So um, let's see. So it's also lightweight, which means it's not as energy intensive to transport to and from recycling facilities as some heavier packaging is. Like sometimes that's an obstacle for glass, for example. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, you just listened to me talk about how much it takes to turn bauxite into aluminum for like 15 minutes and I'm just scraping the surface. So if you think about going through all of that just to drink your can of soda and then you throw the can in the landfill and bury it where we can never use it again and then just do that whole process again, that's just pretty mind-bogglingly dumb. Like I always think that whether you're an environmentalist or not, that just logically doesn't really make sense. Even if you don't really care about, you know, the indigenous people that I just talked about or the trees or the tropics or whatever, like you wouldn't in other circumstances spend so much time and money and energy investing in this thing and then like bury it in your backyard and then go get a new thing when you can just keep using that thing. So producing secondary aluminum, meaning producing new aluminum products out of old aluminum products, recycling them, involves cleaning and separating aluminum scrap from other materials and melting it down in, in a furnace but compared to the energy requirements of primary production, secondary production is much less energy intensive. So we actually save 95% of the energy when we recycle. So it's kind of a no brainer. 
Um, recycled aluminum can be back on the shelves in six weeks. We skip all the mining, the caustic mud sludge, pollution, human rights violations, great. Um, with the energy it takes to make just one new aluminum can from bauxite ore, you can make 20 recycled aluminum cans. So again, I said this one is kind of the poster child. This, is, <laughs> this one's more black and white than the rest. But whenever I see aluminum in the trash can, I'm like, guys, <laughs> we really have to be recycling this one. This one is really a no-brainer. Okay. Catch my breath for a sec. Drink my emergency. Ah, um, Ellen says, fun fact, Charles Martin Hall, who is the person I just um, talked about with the hall Heralt process, was an Oberlin College alum and used his money to help fund our college. Very cool. Cool guy. All right. Now we're moving on to glass. Um, so just so you know, we're going to cover aluminum, glass, paper, and plastic. So obviously that's not all the materials in the world that we use, but um, it's kind of the main, the big four in the zero waste world and the recycling world. So we're going to talk about those four. Plus, I'm going into so much detail that I don't think you want me to cover other things right now. <laughs> It'd just be a long monologue for me. OK, so we're going to move on to glass. So we see it most often in beverage bottles and jars, um, but also obviously as more durable items like a vase or um, a window. Um, and like I said, just as a reminder, I can see some people are um, putting things in um, the Q&A box. I will wait until the end to go over them because otherwise I'm just going to be scattered and <laughs> no one wants to see that. So keep submitting your questions when you think of them um, and we'll, we'll look at them at the end. Okay, so glass. Okay, so glass is made of silica sand, which is quartz that over time um, through the work of water and wind has been broken down into these tiny little granules that you see in this picture. Obviously, there's sand all over the place. You guys are no stranger to sand. <laughs> but in the US, most of our silica sand that goes into glass comes from the Midwest. Um, OK, so we get, mining, we get bauxite from strip mining, but we get silica from open pit mining, which is a different thing. So this means instead of just scraping off the surface, we blast a big old hole in the ground. Um, so this is a video of there's not much to see, but it's just kind of illustrating. Um, it's not really that same like flat, just scrape situation that we saw with bauxite. It's like really getting in there um, and getting deep into the surface of the earth. So there's a lot of bulldozing and blasting. So some of the effects of open pit mining include erosion, formation of sinkholes, biodiversity loss, and contamination of groundwater by chemicals from the mining process in general, but specifically with open pit mining. Um, so let's see, silica mining is also done for fracking. That's another big reason that we get silica other than glass. Um, they use it in the fracking process to let oil and gas pass through the cracks. Um, and I will talk about fracking when we talk about plastic, so you'll learn more about silica then. Um, and silica mining is also controversial in a human rights lens because the microscopic little sharp pieces are inhaled by miners and they stay in their lungs. So it's not great to be a silica miner. Um, okay, so the production process um, is a little shorter than um, the aluminum, the bauxite to aluminum process. Um, it's not as complicated, basically it's melted. So again, <laughs> we're kind of scraping the surface here. Um, but I think we all understand this one probably a little bit better than we understood um, the bauxite one before coming into this training. So silica sand melts at the incredibly high temperature of 3,090 degrees Fahrenheit, which again, I don't even have a good concept of how hot that is. It's really hot. So they have a mixture that they melt together um, at kind of different proportions. So cullet, which is a term for recycled glass, is one of the components. Um, silica. Soda ash, um, which is sodium carbonate, and limestone, so calcium carbonate. So the soda ash they put in there to reduce the melting temperature of the glass to kind of conserve energy when they melt it down. Um, but unfortunately, if they just left it at soda ash, that would make the glass kind of dissolve in water. So they had to put limestone in there to prevent that from happening. 
So that's an interesting thing I didn't know before this. Um, and so then the glass is either molded in the case of things like jars or bottles or floated um, in the case of things like sheet or plate glass. So here's a bonkers video showing what the process looks like very briefly. It's basically just, it looks like lava just being shot around a warehouse, but at the end you'll see it start to form into bottles. So we're just gonna watch it for a minute. Um, basically everything is just really, 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 really hot. Okay. <laughs> it really just looks like lava. It looks like a star, like pew, pew, pew. <laughs> okay, we're almost to bottles. Wild. I wish I could like describe what's happening, but I really, <laughs> they're just <laughs> taking silica, heating it up super hot and molding it into bottles. There they are. So that's something we would recognize as a bottle, but it's pretty crazy to think that it was just sand. Okay, so this, <laughs> this video goes on, but I just wanted to stop it when we can see the final product of the bottle. Um, but I'll send out this slide deck so you can see, you can watch more of it if you want. Um, great. Okay, so why recycling glass makes sense. So glass is one of the most energy intensive industries due to the high temperature needed to melt the raw material. So we just saw, I said 3,090 degrees Fahrenheit. It's so hot um, and we need energy to make something that hot. So there's an estimation that one, each one kilogram of glass produced, nope, each one kilogram of glass produces 16.9 megajoules of waste heat. The production of each one kilogram of glass releases 0.57 kilograms of CO2. Recycling glass saves 74% of the energy it takes to make glass from raw materials. And that's because once we have it as glass, that cullet, that recycled glass melts at a lower temperature than those virgin raw materials. So it's easier to melt glass back into glass than it is to melt sand into glass. Um, and we also have a closed loop on glass here in Colorado. I know not all of you are in Colorado, but a lot of you are. So that means that your glass comes to our facility to get sorted, and then it's sent to Momentum Glass, which sorts it by color and takes out little pieces of contamination and some other things. Um, and then it's sent to a bottling company and then right back to you. So as I mentioned, one of the obstacles to recycling glass um, is weight. So, excuse me, since it's so heavy, sometimes um, that transportation can be um, a challenge and that's why if you go to some other um, locations glass may not be on the recycling guidelines even though it is good at being melted down and turned back into whatever it was without losing quality um, here having a closed loop um, meaning a local local facilities all near each other is really important to glass and we're really lucky to have that here in colorado okay let's move on to paper I think this is one that most people are more familiar with um, in terms of the process and you kind of know where it comes from. Um, okay, so coniferous and deciduous trees are their primary pulp and paper sources, but companies don't just do their logging in temperate regions where the pine forests um, thrive. According to the Encyclopedia of Occupational Health and Safety, companies also harvest in tropical and boreal forests. So paper is made of softwood, and hardwood trees, but 85% of the wood pulp that makes paper in the U.S. comes from softwood coniferous trees. We have lots of forestry areas here in the U.S., especially in places like the Pacific Northwest, for example, um, but deforestation for paper and wood products happen all over the world from temperate to tropical forests. Tropical forests, like those in Indonesia and Brazil, for example, are being lost at the rate of two football fields a minute and contribute the same amount of global warming pollution as all of the world's transportation emissions. So stopping forest loss is critical in our efforts to address the climate crisis. 
Only about 2% of the logging done in Indonesia is legal, according to the NRDC, and it's being fueled by our growing global appetite for pulp, paper, furniture, and palm oil. So I think we've heard a lot more about palm oil recently, oil recently um, in the past year or so than we have ever before. Um, but it's all tied into deforestation. So everywhere, products like toilet paper and paper towels are um, often made of old growth trees, which are key in sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere. So if we're gonna be cutting down trees, we should really try not to cut down those old growth trees. Um, so not only are they taking, when I say carbon sequestration, I'm referring um, to the fact that tr plants and trees and soil have the capacity to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere um, and store it safely into our soils and in the actual body of those plants. So that's a really, really important solution to the climate crisis. Not to mention they make our oxygen, which is also important to us. So we're really taking one of our most valuable resources ever and literally flushing it down the toilet when we're making old growth trees into toilet paper. So those aliens are kind of looking at us like, what are you guys doing? Especially in that case. So if you think about how useless a piece of junk mail is, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. I mean, you don't even look at it, let alone use it for anything. And we use our precious trees to make that. We only started using trees for paper in the US when this country was first settled um, because there was such an abundance of trees that needed to be cleared to make room for agriculture. So we just used it for paper. But for thousands of years um, before that, paper was made from rice and cotton and hemp and other plants that are easier to make into paper than trees are because they have less lignin. So I'll talk about lignin um, in just a moment. Um, but first I'm going to talk about the extraction process. So in order to get the trees um, to, in order to actually get to the trees so that they can start to log them, roads have to be built into the forest. So that's when we talked about bauxite um, and we were talking about the Human Rights Watch. Um, we talked about those, all those roads and railway tracks and things crisscrossing formerly kind of untouched land. Um, and roads are kind of one of the things that people don't really think about in terms of mining. Um, but we have to get to that place in order to start doing the mining. Um, so these roads are often um, built at the taxpayer's expense since the forest may be on public land. And then of course the trees are actually cut down. So like I was just talking about, um, forests house carbon in their wood, their leaves and the soil. And so when loggers and developers cut down the forest, CO2 escapes back into the atmosphere. It was formerly stored in those trees and a deforested area can't absorb and store any more CO2. Um, furthermore, like I talked about with bauxite, aluminum <laughs> animals, it's a totally different word. I was had aluminum on the brain. Um, I meant as I was talking about with bauxite, with paper, animals and indigenous people who once in, depended on those forests for life can no longer do so. Um, wood products, including paper, account for about 10% of total deforestation. Cattle, soybeans, and palm oil are other major culprits. So when they're actually cutting it down, first the tree is felled, and then it's delimbed and topped, and then it's loaded onto a cable skitter, lots of new vocab here, uh, which is the pictured piece of machinery here, and then it's taken to a log yard. So once at the log yard, the trees are cut up by chainsaws and other machinery. Um, from there, they go to the paper mill. So this is just our quick yard log um, footage. Okay, so we can just see a lot of felled trees. Some water usage here. Okay, so now to the paper mill we go. So at the paper mill, the process goes like this. So first the wood is shredded and into wood chips, and then it's cooked under pressure. Again, there's that high high temperature, high pressure um, buzzword that should be cueing energy use in your mind. Um, so it's cooked under pressure into mulch at a very high temperature. Then it's washed with chemicals and the lignin is removed and the pulp is bleached. Lastly, it's dried and the water is squeezed out. So I mentioned lignin before um, because this is one of the tricky things about making trees into paper. So lignin is an organic polymer found in the cell walls of some plants like trees. Um, which makes the plant dark and kind of rigid and woody and like a tree. <laughs> and we have to work hard to extract that lignin so that the paper can be white and not woody. <laughs> like you like your paper, not woody. So chemical pulping 
also commonly referred to as craft pulping, is the most common way to make pulp. It use, utilizes chemicals and heat to separate the cellulose wood fibers from the lignin, leaving a pulp mixture that produces stronger paper than other methods. So mechanical pulping is another method, and it uses machines to macerate wood chips into pulp. The pulp made during this process is typically shorter in length and weaker and contains more lignin um, than chemical pulps. So this paper is usually used for phone books, um, newspaper, other similar products where it's not that same high quality as like your cardstock, for example. Um, so as I mentioned before, there are lots of other plants with lower lignin content. So if we're making our paper directly out of plants rather than recycled material, um, it would make sense to be making it out of hemp, rice, or other alternatives that aren't naturally um, dark and woody, like trees are. Um, when we use the bleach to remove the lignin, it creates another huge impact of the paper making process. Um, so the production of dioxins, a group of highly toxic chemical compounds that can cause pro problems with reproduction, development, and the immune system. So um, they can also disrupt hormones and lead to cancer. Um, dioxins, dioxins can remain in the environment for many years. They're known as POPs, persistent organic pollutants. Dioxins are so persistent and pervasive throughout the planet systems, we actually all have them in our systems. We have a, um, I have a whole training about microplastics and how microplastics are just in our water and our soil and our fish and our bodies. And it's the same story with dioxins. They've, they've infiltrated the ecosystem. Um, even polar bears have dioxin in their, um, in their bodies. And a private study was done about dioxins in breast milk. And the study found a mean level of 7.5 parts per trillion of the most toxic form of dioxin um, in samples of breast milk from 50 women. And there were about 1,000 parts per trillion of all forms of dioxin in all the milk samples. So dioxins, when we talk about the, the impacts of paper making process, we got to mention dioxins. OK, so why recycling makes sense in the case of paper. So 100% post-consumer recycled office paper lessens the carbon footprint by five pounds of CO2 per ream, reduces water pollution by 35%, and makes for 74% less air pollution than most non-post-consumer non recycled material. So that was a comparison between uh, when we take paper and turn it into new paper, and when we take trees and turn them into paper, so virgin paper. Um, so again, that's five pounds of CO2 fewer per ream when we're talking recycled, uh, reduces water pollution by 35% and makes for 74% less air pollution. So um, that's when we take 100% post-consumer recycled material, that means that 100% of the fibers in your new piece of paper are from another piece of paper rather than a new tree. So currently things like coffee cups are almost always made from virgin paper rather than recycled, and then they're coated in plastic so we can't even recycle them and give them a life as a new paper product. So it's a pretty silly thing to cut our trees down for, especially if they're only going to have one life as a coffee cup. So, you know, like a two minute life. Um, paper, if it is in the form of a recyclable product, can be recycled five to seven times. And every time we recycle it, the fibers get shorter and shorter. So that um, paper product kind of becomes less and less durable. Um, so when we talked about aluminum and glass, they look like this and paper looks a little more like that. Um, uh, let's see. So when we, re when we use recycled content paper, we save ourselves from a whole lot of the environmental and health impacts. Um, so, and because it was already bleached, because we already turned it into paper, it was already bleached, the lignin is gone. So we don't have to remove the lignin again, which is great for um, when I was talking about dioxins, not to mention all the energy input. Um, and so then they, they just use hydrogen peroxide to re-whiten the paper rather than that whole lignin extraction and bleach process. Um, and plus, we don't cut down any new trees when we recycle, so that's pretty simple. If we buy things like toilet paper that are 100% post-consumer recycled, um, we're not taking our most precious resources and flushing them down the toilet, like I talked about in the beginning, because we're not using any new trees to make that toilet paper. Um, so it's important for you to recycle your paper. It's important for someone like us to um, recycle it into a new product, so us and the, and the um, paper recyclers. But then closing that loop is buying those products made from post-consumer recycled materials. So if you're recycling your paper in your office all day, um, and then we're 
sorting them, then we're sending to a paper recycler and they're making them into new, you know, um, toilet paper that's made of 100% post-consumer recycled paper, but nobody's buying that 100% post-consumer recycled paper, um, then we really can't continue that loop. We need, um, we need to create demand for the recycling industry by buying things that are made of post-consumer recycled paper. So uh, toilet paper is a great one, paper towels, things like that, looking for um, like this little picture, things that say 100% post-consumer recycled paper. Um, so there is a challenge here also called subsidies, <laughs> which I'll talk about again when we get to plastics. Um, but basically the timber industry is sub subsidized. So that's um, an obstacle for recycled paper since it makes it less financially viable than logging. Um, we wouldn't be making paper out of trees, really, if it weren't for the subsidies creating a false economic comparison between virgin paper and recycled paper. Um, so that's why recycled paper is actually typically more expensive to buy than virgin, which is not great for us. So besides the subsidies, recycled paper, um, <laughs> due to all the stats that I just listed, is the obvious winner over virgin paper. But I'll talk a little bit more about subsidies um, later on when we talk about plastics. Okay, so last thing on the paper before we move on to plastics. Um, this is an example of the impact of the paper industry and one of the poster children for using our most precious resources for something that adds no real value to our lives, junk mail. Um, like I said in the beginning of this training, we've done some amazing things with our resources, even plastic, and I'm not advocating that we stop using them for things that really matter. But there are also a lot of things that we make out of our resources um, that absolutely don't warrant extracting and refining finite resources. And junk mail is one of them. So just the fact that I can say junk mail and you all know exactly what I'm talking about um, pretty much uh, illustrates that we all universally recognize that this product is useless and we don't use it and we don't look at it. So why are we using our literal source of oxygen to make it? Every day in the forest of Northern Canada, majestic trees are cut to stumps at a rate of two acres a minute, 24 hours a day, to produce junk mail and other paper products. These trees are not only critical in combating climate change by absorbing carbon from the Earth's atmosphere, they are also home to Native people who watch helplessly as they lose everything they know to corporate paper company interests. So in 2013, this is an old statistic, um, so we're being conservative here, the U.S. produced approximately 20,700,000 tons of paper. This level of production uses up to 110 million trees in a year for paper alone. So let's say that there's 117 million households in the U.S. So again, the statistic is old, so we're being conservative. So that means that 13 million trees are destroyed each year to make junk mail alone. So <laughs> um, like I said, I think sometimes um, zero waste messages can be misconstrued to be um, advocating. People think that people are zero waste advocates are advocating for kind of returning to the stone age and not using any of our resources and living like animals, but we're really not. We're just using our most precious resources in a really unwise way. Um, we're using them. <laughs> we're taking our source of oxygen and we're making it into a coupon about mattresses that nobody looks at and then they throw away because it's covered in plastic. Okay, now plastic. This is the last one. So this is really a hot topic. Um, people are really revved up about plastic and rightly so. We've been revved up about plastic since 1976 um, and I think it's great that we're talking about it more and more now. So a lot of us are familiar with the negative impacts of plastic downstream. We've all seen the turtle with the straw in its nose and the whale cut open with all the plastic in it and all that yucky stuff. Um, but lots of people still don't understand the upstream impacts of plastic, which is also a huge part of why we're not huge fans of plastics, especially single-use plastics. So um, plastic is made of oil and gas. We get it from fracking. So here's a map of fracking rigs in the U.S. Um, uh, we get oil and gas all from all over the world, but this is just the U.S. map, and we can see that um, we do have a lot of rigs in Colorado, if you're tuning in from Colorado. So I think if you're interested in the environment and in the front range area, you probably, or just in general, you probably know at least a little bit about this process. So I won't go too far into what fracking entails. Um, so fracking is short for hydraulic fracturing. It's a process by which water, sand, the silica that we just talked about with glass, um, and chemicals are injected underground 
at a very high pressure to crack open rock layers and release the oil and gas trapped inside. So these are the steps just very briefly. Um, so first a well bore or a hole needs to be drilled all the way down um, to that layer of gas rich shale. So the shale layer can sit more than 5,000 feet underground and drilling can take as long as a month. Once the drill reaches down into the shale layer, it kind of turns and begins drilling horizontally uh, for a mile or more along the rock. And then a perforating gun <laughs> loaded with explosive charges is lowered down um, to the bottom of the well and then it punctures little holes into that horizontal section of the casing that's just deep down there in the shale layer. And then now comes the actual fracking or the completion stage. So a mixture of water, sand, our friend sand, um, and chemicals are pumped into the well at extremely high pressures. And then they go through the tiny holes in the casing that we just made um, in step three, our perforating gun. Um, so the fluids crack open that shale rock and then the sand, silica, holds those cracks open. And so then um, the chemicals help the natural gas seep out. The flow back stage is just where the water and chemicals flow back out of the well and are taken for disposal or treatment, hopefully. Um, and then finally, the natural gas begins flowing from the shale up and out of the well, um, where it's eventually shipped to consumers through a pipeline. So that's um, how we extract it. That's how fracking works. So obviously, all of that oil and gas that we've extracted via fracking um, don't go into plastics, but it is one of the products. So I always say, if you care about um, oil and gas, if you care about fossil fuels, if you care about fracking, you care about plastics because it's the same product. It's the same process, just a different product. Um, okay, so now we have that crude oil, um, but it needs to be refined to turn it into plastic. So at the oil refinery, there are a lot of different hydrocarbons and petroleum needs to be refined out of that crude oil to start making plastics. So um, it undergoes fractional distillation to isolate that petroleum, which requires a lot of heat energy. And then we have to take those large hydrocarbons and break them into smaller ones. And this is called cracking. So we have fracking and then cracking. <laughs> so ethane and propane are cracked into ethylene and propylene using high temperature furnaces. And now we're getting more into the, the words that we're familiar with if we're really <laughs> into zero waste and plastics. Propylene, like polypropylene. Um, so once these hydrocarbons are obtained from cracking, um, they're chemically processed to make hydrocarbon monomers and other car carbon monomers like styrene, um, vinyl chloride, things like that. Um, those things are used in plastics. Um, next, the monomers carry out polymerization reactions in large polymerization plants. So the reactions produce polymer resins, which resins, that's what we call those different types of plastics, like a resin number is that number on the bottom of a plastic. Um, so those are collected and then further processed and processing can include the addition of plasticizers, dyes and flame retardant chemicals. And then that final polymer resin um, usually shows up in the form of pellets called nurdles. Nurdles is one of my favorite zero waste <laughs> vocabulary terms. And uh, the picture here shows some, some good nurdles. <laughs> um, so then the, the nurdles go to the producers of the plastic product um, where they use various heat intensive molding techniques to make the resins into the product. So they, they have all these nurdles and then they still have to turn them into your laundry detergent jug, for example. Ooh, I'm really out of breath, guys. <laughs> okay, so uh, why recycling makes sense for plastics? I put a little question mark because <laughs> is it, does it make sense? Um, this one is a little different from the first three because recycling was never designed for plastics and really vice versa. It's, <laughs> as recyclers, we're not huge fans of plastics. Um, so does recycling plastic, if you're recycling something that is recyclable in the form of plastic, um, does it save energy and resources and lessen the impact on our environment? Yes, it does. So one type, <laughs> one ton of recycled plastic saves 5,700 kilowatts of energy 16.3 barrels of oil, 98 million BTUs of energy, and 30 cubic yards of landfill space. So if you have a recyclable plastic and you recycle it, um, you are still doing good. It's not that you're um, harming the environment by recycling. Recycling does still make sense if we already have that stuff and it is in fact recyclable. Um, but so will recycling solve the plas plastics crisis? Absolutely not. Um, plastics, unlike our friends glass and aluminum, are not inherently good at being melted down and turned back into something new 
infinitely without using, losing quality. So they're not infinitely recyclable, um, but we also know that whether something's recyclable or not depends on facilities and markets. Um, and so that's the other issue with plastics recycling. So we talked about why all the other materials make sense to recycle and they make financial sense too. So if I'm a producer of paper or aluminum or glass, I'm gonna buy back my own material after it's been recycled since um, skipping that whole extraction process not only reduces environmental impact, but it makes more sense for me as a producer to buy back recycled aluminum rather than go back into the tropics and go up to Iceland and do that whole bauxite thing again. Um, so all the industries producing these materials are buying back their own product to make new product, um, which creates demand and adds value to the recycled product, which keeps our recycling industry going. But in the case of plastics, um, it is not cheaper for them to buy back recycled plastic to make a new plastic. It's cheaper for them to keep drilling. So oil and gas is not only super cheap, but it's subsidized. Again, uh, we talked about subsidized in logging and now uh, it's really relevant in the fossil fuel world. Um, so it makes more financial sense for plastic producers to keep making stuff out of virgin oil. Um, rather than buying back my recycled plastic bottle to turn into a new one. So they could turn a PETE bottle back into a PETE bottle, not infinitely, but a handful of times. Um, but rather than do that, they just keep making new bottles out of new oil. Um, and then that bottle that you recycled will get turned into something like a carpet or pants or shoes, something like that. Um, so the fact that they don't buy it back means that there's not a high demand for that post-consumer material. And since we have to work so hard as recyclers to sort out um, each type of plastic using expensive lasers um, and lots of hard work hand sorting, we do have actual humans touching your stuff and sorting it um, into different bales. So we as recyclers actually lose money on plastics because of that. So while it's cool for your number one PETE bottle to get turned into pants, um, consider that the pants will end up in the landfill eventually. Um, and we haven't actually slowed down that initial drilling process. And so maybe it would make more sense to just skip that bottle, even though it's recyclable. So um, recycle the bottles, tubs, jugs, jars, uh, whatever you have in the way of recyclable plastics. But the best thing to do by far, um, especially in the case of plastics, is to just reduce your plastic consumption in the first place. Um, okay, so like I talked about junk mail as um, kind of a case study in the paper industry. Um, I'm going to talk about bottled water. So this is a good example of plastics not being sustainable, even if they're recyclable. Um, so we're going to talk about the story of bottled water. So water is obviously crucial to human survival. And at the dawn of the 21st century, we started paying for it by the billions in one of the biggest marketing shams ever. Um, marketing experts have convinced many of us that bottled water tastes better and it's cleaner and it's healthier and that you can no longer trust good old tap water. Um, but meanwhile, behind the scenes, multinational companies are tapping public water supplies, the freshwater aquifers that took thousands of years to form and once supported local agriculture and inhabitants for their water bottling plants. So now citizens from the US to India are being denied access to their wells and watch helplessly as their aquifers are being outbid for them um, as their aquifers are being privatized and drained faster than they're being replenished because corporations outbid them for those water rights. Halfway across the planet, oil is being tapped in war-torn countries to make number one PETE plastic water bottles, requiring more than 17 million barrels of oil every year. Every week, Americans buy more than half a billion, with a B, bottles of water and only 20% are recycled creating a constant demand for more oil, more oil and more fracking. Um, sold with less testing than tap water, it is less regulated and less tested than our actual tap water. Um, and at 100 to 10,000 times the price, sales for bottled water are finally slowing, but the continued onslaught of plastic bo wa bottle waste tells us that this story is anything but common knowledge. Ugh. So this is an example of an almost always unnecessary product that even though it is recyclable, it's better to reduce it and skip it altogether whenever you can. Obviously, sometimes you can't. I'm not saying you can never have bottled water if you need it. Um, but a lot of people just buy a case every week when their tap water is cleaner. Um, okay, so really, that's the bottom line. Recycling absolutely makes sense as an industry and as a process for lots of materials. And you should trust recycling and you should be into it and you should be excited about it. 
Um, you should keep recycling plastics that you have that are recyclable, but the best thing to do moving forward is just to skip it whenever you can. So reduce, reuse, recycle, that's, you know, we all know reduce, reuse, recycle, but it's not some just little cute motto that we thought of. It's actually a hierarchy um, by the EPA. Um, that's the EPA made up to illustrate the priorities in reducing waste. So you can see it here. Um, the most important one is to reduce. Just don't even, <laughs> don't even have the waste in the first place. So reduce, reuse, recycle is in an order, in that order um, for a reason. So we should recycle as a way to um, solve the climate crisis and a way to solve the waste crisis and a way to avoid all the mining that we're doing and <laughs> avoid all the waste at the end. Um, but it's not the solution. We really have to do reduce and reuse and redesign first um, and not rely only on recycling to get us out of this mess, especially with stuff like plastics. Ah, okay, so um, not just we as consumers, but communities and governments have also been focused on downstream, um, setting up collections for materials, but now we need them and industry to be focused on upstream as well. So I always say that we as individuals are making a difference just in our own habits and daily lives and don't let anyone tell you that your efforts aren't impactful because, you know, if seven whatever billion people on the planet all decide to do something, it's going to get done. Um, but we also really need to be working on the larger systems around us so that everyone is equally set up for success. So we can be doing that in the following ways. Um, knowing the upstream story for each of these materials helps us keep an eye out for opportunities as we, um, we as purchasers can avoid um, packaging. So skipping the packaging of any kind whenever we can, but especially in the case of plastics, is always one step before recycling. And the more as we more we as a society understand these upstream impacts, the more we as a whole can look at ways we can avoid them by changing our systems and doing things like ending subsidies for virgin materials, like I talked about, to let recycled content compete fairly with virgin content economically. If we end the subsidies, using recycled content will always be the winner financially and environmentally. Passing policies that avoid single-use plastic. These policies are gaining ground, um, mostly because of their downstream impact on the ocean, um, but the upstream impact is equally critical to avoid. Passing, passing policies to eliminate bottled water um, from government purchasing is a good example. So here in Boulder, for example, the city of Boulder no longer allows um, city of Boulder employees to purchase bottled water for meetings and other things like that. Um, so leading by example is a really cool thing. Minimum recycled content standards for new products. Um, so it's not just you, it's on you as a consumer to look for that label that says post-consumer recycled material. We should be passing policies that require um, new products to be made of a certain amount of recycled content. Again, to create that demand and um, help recycling happen. Um, and then extended producer responsibility, EPR um, laws that require producers to take their product back for remanufacturing. So like I said, um, an example of, uh, I had the example of the bottle. So the plastic bottle, um, the, generally the, the people making the plastic bottles aren't buying back those recycled bottles to make new ones. Um, and so somebody else has to make them into a carpet. Um, but a carton is a great example of um, how if every manufacturer took responsibility for the whole life cycle of their product, really anything could be recycled. Anything could be recyclable if we have um, the markets and the facilities that will support them. So if we pass laws holding um, producers responsible for their own waste, um, then it doesn't have to fall on we as, as people um, to take care of it. So I think I, think I saw a chat pop up um, when I was in the middle of this talking about, yeah, we should all be recycling aluminum, but what about the people who are making aluminum? Like it's, it shouldn't be all on us. And I totally agree. I always say it's one thing for us to all care and um, make an impact um, in our own individual lives, but it's another thing for us to be building um, and improving and changing the bigger systems around us so that regardless of status or um, situation, everyone is set up for success and we don't have to um, take care of the waste that somebody else made. Marty says carbon tax, please. Yes. Okay. Well, that was so much information. Um, so <laughs> this is our conclusion. So it's time for questions. So again, I can't hear or see any of you, but um, we, I know we have the chat button is going off. Um, it looks like we have a lot of stuff in the Q&A box. So you can click the Q&A box 
um, in the bottom and then um, type it in and I'll do my best to, <laughs> to answer them. So I think just, just as a heads up, um, I am very used to answering questions about general recycling and the questions that I get every day talking to people. Um, but all this presentation, I just did a lot of research for. And so I don't, I'm not an expert in all of it. I'm learning it along with you. So I might not know the answer to a bunch of them, but um, I am going to send out a follow-up email to everyone there who registered so that um, I can answer, I can get answers to those questions that I might not be able to answer. And um, Marty Mach is our deputy director and Kate Bailey um, knows everything. And they both work at EcoCycle with me and I can phone a friend <laughs> if they answer my text, if you have questions that I can't answer. Okay, Ari, are you there? Sure am. Yay, let's do it. Okay, so let me just start at the, oh, this doesn't show them exactly in order. I'm gonna start while you're doing that. Does aluminum foil have to be completely clean in order to recycle it? That's a great question. Um, so, um, no, but <laughs> try your best. So with all of our containers and all of our food packaging that is recyclable, we always say like, if you have access to a sink and you can give it a little splash of water, if you can scrub it off, amazing, do it. Um, if it's like, has a tiny bit of grease on it, we're not gonna throw it away. Um, we're not gonna throw away a whole load. So always um, with food packaging, just do your best um, to make it clean because we have real people working at our facility and, um, they when food piles up they get stung by wasps and there's rats and they get sick from the mold and then we don't really get paid for that um stuff so my answer is do your best but don't give us like a burrito wrapped in aluminum okay okay <sighs> sherry asked is aluminum recycling done locally or at least in the u.s um let's see Wait, I know this one. Uh, um, do you know it, Ari? Who's our aluminum recycler? Wait. We do have an answer to this one. Let's see, I'm gonna read these while I You want to circle back to that one? Are we phoning? Because yeah. I, I, I know that we, I know that we have that information. <laughs> so I think a good answer for this, though, kind of, is that we do it. We like personally in Colorado, we do it locally. Um, it may vary based on where you are. Yes. So aluminum, yeah, is there is um, aluminum recycling in Colorado? Um, ours is currently being um, sent to Wyoming, so our neighbor, but yeah. not not back to Iceland is the question is the answer to that. <laughs> Um, cause it's already smelted. Okay. Marty says, may I have a copy of your slide deck? Yes. Um, I will send this out to everyone. I'll send out the video recording and my actual slide deck. Are the tops of plastic containers and glass containers recycled? Um, yeah, the caps. Um, that's a great question. So, um, if it's, so plastic containers, if it's a plastic cap on a plastic container, like a bottle, or a peanut butter jar or whatever, it's plastic on plastic, that's fine. Again, as long as the container is empty and as clean as you can get it. Um, if it's um, something like, this is for Boulder County, by the way. Um, your local recycling guidelines may vary. Um, if it's glass, like a kombucha bottle with a plastic cap, we want you to go ahead and take off that plastic cap and put it in the trash and then recycle the glass bottle um, because the little plastic cap by itself will fall through the cracks and we don't want it attached to the glass because they're two different um, uh, materials. And then metal, if it's a metal, um, it'll get picked up by our magnet. So like the metal top of an, of a pickle jar, um, you can go ahead and separate them and put them both in. Um, let's see. Yeah. So Ellen said, why does recycled copy paper cost more than non-recycled? Seems criminal. Yeah. Um, that's just the subsidy thing that I was talking about. So the, the logging industry is subsidized like oil and gas. So that means um, that they are motivated to keep, um, keep 
getting that virgin material rather than using recycled. Um, and that's why it jacks up the price or jacks down the price of virgin content and, um, and it, it creates that false economic comparison. When if we didn't have those subsidies, um, uh, recycled content would win. Um, let's see. There's a lot. <laughs> Ari, do you have any that are sticking out to you? Yeah, sorry. The thing wasn't popping up so I could unmute myself since I'm sharing my screen. Um, let's see, because there's chat and there's Q&A, so we're trying to keep up. Yes, there. if you have questions, please try and put them in the Q&A if you can. And I know um, Rachel just mentioned that to everybody. So thanks, Rachel, for keeping an eye out. Um, mm. Michelle just said, can you talk about the importance of opening junk mail? That's a great one. So most things that you get in the mail are recyclable. You know, it's just like kind of bills and envelopes and ads and things like that. Um, but sometimes they'll slip in things that aren't recyclable. And a lot of times we'll just like not even look at junk mail, not even open it and throw it all in the recycling. Um, and that's a problem because sometimes there's something like, um, you know, a credit card in there or stickers or booger glue. Um, and that's a really critical one. So booger glue, <laughs> I don't know if you can picture it, but it's like that stuff, that really sticky stuff that you stick um, a credit card onto a paper with, for example, and you can like peel it off and like play with it. Um, and that is really hard. Um, that's a contaminant in the paper recycling process because it, you can't really extract it and then it'll jam things up and then it'll start to rip new paper as they make it. Um, so we really wanna make sure that if you're gonna recycle your junk mail that you just open it and make sure there's no booger glue or plastic items in there. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, Barbara Mills, this may have already been addressed, but I'll just bring it up one more time so you can, uh, so you can bring the, the point back. Um, she said, I agree it's a good thing to recycle. She said specifically aluminum cans. It was from that part of the conversation. She said, the question remains, how did the corporations marketing their products make it our responsibility? Shouldn't they bear some responsibility? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the answer to that is yes. Um, it's, I mean, you know, corporations aren't really going to do, some of them are doing great stuff just because they want to and because it's the right thing to do, but a lot of corporations aren't going to do the right thing until they, um, until they legally have to. So EPR laws are really hard to pass, again, extended producer responsibility laws, um, but <laughs> they should be if corporations aren't going to do the right thing themselves and pawned off on it. Like, I think there was a whole discussion about um, the straw craze and when it became really popular to, um, to talk about straws and their impact on turtles and to refuse straws, you know, a bunch of restaurants were adopting a no straw policy or uh, straws upon request. And that's like a really interesting example of, um, of the plastics pollution problem being framed as an individual problem. Like it's on us to just not ask for a straw or specifically ask for no straw. Um, and it's really like, you know, we didn't get here because individuals forgot to ask for a straw. We got here because of the structural, the systems around us that set us up for success. I mean, they don't set us up for success and then we have to work extra hard to not get straws. Um, I have another one for you, Rose. Mm -hmm. um, Brianna said, I know we need to remove the shrink wrap labels on aluminum cans but should we also remove sticker labels? Yeah, those are two things that are new. Um, so typically with something like a beer can, um, they used to just print the label right onto the can, onto the aluminum can. And then in our recycling facility, we have different machines all looking for different materials and sorting them into different places. So, um, so for uh, plastic, we have lasers that are looking for different kinds of plastic. So we have one laser that's looking for a PETE plastic, so like a water bottle. Um, and that's what that shrink wrap is made of. So now aluminum uh, can like when they make aluminum cans, they're starting to shrink wrap their label onto it rather than print it because again, plastic is cheaper. Um, and so then when that aluminum can goes through our recycling center, the lasers see it and then they say, oh, there's some PETE plastic going by and then they shoot it into our plastic um, bale and then we lose aluminum, which is our most valuable material. Um, so I just wanted to give a background of what that question was about. So. Um, we're figuring out what to do about that, but uh, in the meantime, um, if you get, have a can, check whether there's like a shrink wrap on it and try to get it off if you can. Um, and my understanding is that we'd like 
the same to be done with a sticker. It's often pretty much the same thing. Um, I know that like in Lafayette, um, what's it called? My brain's shutting down. Um, it's a number. Wow, I'm not gonna think of it. Anyway, they put these like big plastic stickers on their label because it's cheaper. Um, and it would be great to not only try to take it off, but also um, reach out to your local brewery who's doing that um, to see if they can stop. Um, so don't worry about it if it's paper, like the paper label, but if it's that shrink wrap plastic, that's when our optical sorter will think it's plastic. I mean, think the can is plastic. Um, somebody said, what is the water? So when we showed that video of, um, Carissa said that, um, we showed that video of the log yard and then there's like a bunch of water, like in a sprinkler being put onto the logs. Um, and so that's used to slow decay and also, um, to get insects and fungus, um, off of the logs. Um, let's see, somebody else asked about water savings for recycled office paper. So one ton of recycled office paper saves 7,000 gallons of water. It's so much water. Let's see. What else? Um, let's see. Odd 13. Thank you, Jasmine. God. That is what it Not was. <laughs> that was the brewery I was trying to think of. Odd 13. Yes, they're right next door to me. I tell you, it hits like five o'clock and my brain's like, time to not think anymore, which is a problem some of the time. <laughs> okay. Um, la 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 la. Let's see. Um, Did you find one? Somebody, wait. Ooh. There's so many questions, guys. And you can always also, if I don't answer these questions, you can just send them to me too. You can email them to me um, at rosie at ecocycle.org. I'll send you an email. Um, let's see. Do you have to remove the sticker on a glass container? No. Um, labels like on um, a beer bottle or on, you know, your plastic salad clamshell, those are all okay. Um, we've, we, we expect those. Um, it's that new shrink wrap on the aluminum can that we, that it, that's new. Um, Rosie, I found one. Yeah? She, uh, ooh, I just said she, but I don't know. Um, Narelle said with the recycling process, I would think that a lot of glass breaks. What happens to that glass? Yeah, um, so we actually break glass on purpose in the recycling center. Um, that's how we get it out. So, um, the reason that we don't want you to, like, <laughs> shatter a glass item and then put that in your recycling is just because people have to handle it from your house to the recycling center and we don't want we want to limit how many people get cut um so like your hauler we don't want them to cut their hand on the glass um but once it reaches the facility we don't mind if it's um if it's broken up because we we're going to do that anyway so basically um we, ha we have to get glass out of the stream first thing so that our sorters don't touch the glass and cut themselves um, and so everything comes into the facility all mixed together. Um, and so in our county, we have single stream recycling, which means that all of your recycling goes into the same bin. So then at the recycling center, we have to sort out each material so they can be sent to different markets. So the glass um, goes over before it even comes into the facility where people are working. Um, they, it goes over these like ninja stars. They're like these rotating <laughs> sharp things. Um, and it grinds up the glass into smaller pieces. It breaks them up. And then everything passes over a two inch screen, a two inch um, kind of crack in the machinery called the fine screen. So the glass falls through and then everything else passes over. So that's why I said that thing about um, a little tiny plastic cap on a kombucha bottle. We don't want that cap to go through by itself because um, it'll fall through that crack and contaminate the glass. Um, so that's why you want to keep little itty bits out of the recycling is because it's going to fall through that crack um, and get in with the glass. So we don't have to worry about glass later because we don't we don't have to like hand sort it since we already get it out via that process originally. Um, let's see. Um, aluminum cans can be made into other aluminum products. It doesn't have to go back into the same product. 
Um, let's see. It's like when black plastic. Ooh, okay. Yeah, I was just gonna say that. I have heard conflicting stories about recycling black plastic containers, i.e., food containers. Should black plastic number five containers be recycled? Nice. Um, so again, I am um, talk. I'm speaking for Boulder County. So we um, have our own guidelines in Boulder County. And because recycling depends on markets and facilities, guidelines change all over the place. So you could, in your town, not be able to recycle a number five black plastic. So the deal with black plastics is just that they're, it's just kind of a pain. They're just not super valuable because once they're black, um, it's hard to get them to be anything else. So in the case of um, a number five polypropylene food container, um, we can accept that because so it's a number five, um, and it's a food container, and we have a market for that. Uh, we just don't love the black plastic because, again, it doesn't have high value. So if it's in the form of a recyclable product, like um, a to-go container that's not polystyrene, um, things like that, then we can take it. We just, if you can avoid, whenever you can avoid black, that would be great. So like if you have a restaurant that you love that always gives out a black number five um, plastic container, maybe mention it to them, like maybe you didn't know, but um, uh, black plastic is less valuable to recyclers. So if you have the option to switch to white or clear, that would be great. But if you already have the black number five <laughs> plastic food container, we can take it in Boulder County. Oh, uh, let's see. China. Yeah, I was just going to say. <laughs> uh, questions. So does EcoCycle have a market for a plastic right now? Because China didn't, China quit taking it. So yes, um, China, uh, this is all the buzz in the recycling world about China. So the National Sword um, was passed a couple years ago now. And so basically a lot of recyclers were sending their plastics over to China to be recycled. Um, and now China has said, no, we don't want them anymore. There's too much plastic. And like I said, because plastic doesn't do this. So there's just like too much and it's too contaminated. So they said, nope, don't send us plastic anymore. Um, and so basically as recyclers, there's kind of two um, extreme approaches that you can take and recyclers fall, of course, in the middle of that range. But you can either really invest time and money and energy into um, finding and creating and strengthening local markets. So like we talked about our closed loop on glass in Colorado. Um, we did that on purpose. We wanted that to happen and we tried really hard to make it happen. Um, you can invest in doing outreach to your community to make sure that people are only giving you what you can actually sell. Um, and you can invest in a lot of um, sorting technology and hand sorting and making sure that you get all the contamination out to, um, to sort to the needs of your local market. So your local markets are gonna be pickier than um, your international, your, the, Ch the Chinese markets that existed before. Um, and so a lot of recyclers um, were just kind of deciding to not do that. <laughs> so you can either invest in all of that and then have a really clean stream and then be able to market it locally, or you can just kind of skip a lot of that and then just kind of have a dirty stream and then just kind of throw it over to China. So now that China has said, no, stop it. Um, all of those recyclers that were kind of banking on that strategy are now like, oh, ha. <laughs> Now, not only do we have to find local markets, but we have to really up our game in terms of sorting so that we can meet the needs of those markets because they're not gonna take our contaminated um, styrofoam, for example. Um, so EcoCycle is fine. <laughs> we have a tremendous leg up um, in terms of the national sword because not only, like I said, are we one of the oldest recyclers, we've been here since 76, um, when that wasn't an option at the time, um, but also we're really unique in that we're a mission-based nonprofit recycler. So there's only four um, mission-based nonprofit recyclers in the US um, and we are one of them. We're in a little alliance with them. Um, and so sending thing, you know, getting contaminated plastics and saying that polystyrene, we can take polystyrene and throwing them over to China. None of that was ever in our mission in the first place. Um, so we're, <laughs> we're not as affected by the Chinese policy as other recyclers. But that being said, um, we are tied into 
<laughs> into our domestic recycling markets, which are like really feeling the waves. Um, and so again, if we never really saw plastic anymore because we stopped using it, um, that would be great. What about the pumps on lotion bottles? Good question. Um, even though the, the pump, so I said plastic on plastic, plastic is okay. The pump is an exception to that because not only is it like full of lotion, you can't really do anything about that, but it has that spring on it. Um, so lotion, uh, those lotion pumps, we prefer that you take them off and um, put those in the trash and then you recycle the big bottle once you try to get the lotion out. I know it gets soapy and it's hard. Oh, okay. Really winded, guys. <laughs> Sorry, Rosie. I keep forgetting I'm muting myself so I don't make noise, too much noise. Um, someone asked about plastic windows on envelopes. And nice. Hi, Brianna. How are you? She's had some good questions. Yeah. Brianna's our, a really amazing eco-leader in Broomfield. She's making big stuff happen um, with an organization called Sustainable Broomfield. Um, yeah, so plastic windows and on envelopes is fine um, because the average person is not going to take them out. So uh, when they recycle paper, they like whip it around in this big smoothie and then they can kind of skim that plastic off the top. So um, a plastic window like in a bill is okay. Um, but something like plastic coated paper, that's the kind that they can't skim off. So like, a you know, a coffee cup, they can't like just skim off the plastic from that. Um, so that's why a coffee cup is not recyclable, um, but in Boulder County, but um, you don't have to <laughs> labor over trying to take out the little uh, window in a bill. I almost said window and window in a will is what I almost said. Um, and also staples are fine. They have little magnets. They can take them out. Um, someone, Diane asked about, um, she said, I've been told glass from windows is not recyclable. Is that true? And if so, why not? Okay. Um, I saw someone else ask about porcelain, um, which and is porcelain. Yeah. I was just going to say, we can maybe roll that in together. <laughs> Let's see. Um, yeah. So, um, the difference is that when they make a single use glass, like a beer bottle, um, it has a different melting temperature than a durable glass, like, like plate glass, or even like a, a flower vase, something like that. So if we put those all together in the same, uh, little vat, um, then every, the beer bottles would melt down and then the other, the more durable stuff would just like be a chunk. So we can't recycle them together for that reason. Um, so, um, ceramics and porcelain, you can take to the charm, the center for hard to recycle materials. It's like your old toilet, if it's fully broken, <laughs> um, and they like, um, sometimes they put it down, um, uh, before they put down roads. So if you're driving on old toilets. Um, and then play glass, we, is Charm currently taking, I mean, Car Charm is currently closed, um, but we hope to open soon. Um, do we, do we take plate glass. Still, okay, good. So we still take plate glass. So like, if it's reusable, you can take it to resource as well. Same with glass. Yes. Yeah. So we're located right next for those of those folks who may have never been to our Charm facility before. We're located, we're co-located with another organization that utilizes material reuse. Um, so we always try and push people in that direction if they have like building materials or tools or, or windows that are still functioning, old doors, all that kind of stuff. They take that and they reuse it, but if not, um, we can take uh, plate glass, so from windows and like picture frame glass um, and also porcelain uh, and ceramics. Okay, I have two that are good. Um, do you accept milk cartons? Yes, we do. So in Boulder County, um, and in many other places, we accept that Tetra Pak, um, food packaging that you call a carton. So like a milk carton of soup, coconut water, juice, whatever you have. Um, and that is a really cool example of extended producer responsibility. Um, so inherently a carton is not a great recyclable a material because it's made of a bunch of different stuff um, all squished together. So there's like a layer of, you know, plastic and paperboard and aluminum on the inside a lot of times. So we as recyclers, as at the recycling facility, we were like, well, we can't, you know, peel <laughs> these layers apart and sort them. Um, that's, you know, in our machinery, we're just like 
throwing actual objects in different places. So um, Tetra Pak, which is the industry that makes all those cartons, took responsibility for their own product. Uh, they formed, um, well, they're part of the Carton Council. And so the Carton Council financially supports the recycling of cartons. So that's a really great example of how even if the product isn't super great at being, for example, melted down and turned into something else, um, anything could really be recycled if the, if the manufacturer takes financial um, and infrastructural responsibility for the full life cycle of it. Um, so you can, if you Google Carton Council, you can learn a lot more about cartons and its history in recycling. Um, and then Pat Foss, hi Pat, says, can you speak to the reason cups like Solo Cups that are numbered can't be recycled in Boulder County? So yeah, um, plastic cups are a big pain in the butt. Um, so first of all, uh, the numbers, so um, whenever I see people recycling, trying to recycle a plastic item, I see them, you know, looking at the bottom for the, um, for the recycling symbol and the recycling symbol unfortunately doesn't uh it's not meaningful really in the recycling world um it's just an unregulated symbol and it doesn't mean that it's recyclable especially because that item doesn't know where you are and local guidelines change from place to place so um the number is meaningful it's just the resin it's just so we talked about resins we talked about nurdles remember nurdles um so the <laughs> different uh resin numbers is just like what type of plastic is it so i've been saying number one pete bottle that number one that's a number, that's a resin number. Um, and then a different type of plastic is say HDPE, which is the number two. So solo cups, um, if you look at the bottom of a solo cup, you will see a recycling symbol and you will see a number six inside. So number six is polystyrene. So that's the type of plastic that we know as styrofoam. Um, so a lot of us, when we, when we see it as actual styrofoam, like a styrofoam cup or a styrofoam clamshell, um, we recognize that it's like environmentally yucky but it also shows up as something like a solo cup, which is like a crunchy um, plastic that shatters really easily and it has some toxins <laughs> associated with it. So that's our challenge with cups is that um, there's so many different kinds that people will just get really confused about, you know, a paper cup and a number six cup versus a number one cup. And um, we can't really predict <laughs> how the cup is gonna show up when we get it, compostable cups. Um, all of that. So they're just kind of more contamination than they're worth. Not to mention if we, um, if people are recycling cups, they're going to give us the smoothie and the straw and the ice and the lid and all the stuff that we can't take. Um, but the other thing is even if it is um, a more recycling friendly resin, like a one or a two or a five, cups tend to be super brittle. Um, so like if you think about solo cup, how brittle it is, um, if it goes through a truck and then our machine is just going to shatter into a billion pieces and we're not going to be able to recover and recycle all that plastic. So um, cups we don't here in boulder county although in your place of living they may take cups we don't take plastic cups um because they're too much contamination they show up in a bunch of different numbers not to mention paper and compostable um and they shatter so solo cup is weird though because you wouldn't think that it's made of styrofoam but it is that polystyrene number six resin that you kind of know to avoid um, Rosie, there's, there's a um, one about how, um, it says, how has the virus affected your recycling facility? I know Charm is closed, and mm -hmm. I can take that one if you want, or if you were. <laughs> I figured I might give you a quick break from talking, because ah. going and going and going. Um, so, how has the virus affected your recycling facility? So, for those of you who may not know, EcoCycle operates the Boulder County Recycling Center, which is a county-owned building, but we currently operate that facility. And our, amidst COVID-19, things have bit rapidly changed, but recycling has, was deemed an essential service. So we, the Boulder County Recycling Center has remained open. Um, and we've been following all the health and safety guidelines to ensure that our, that our workers are, are safe. Um, but that is still is still operating. And our Center for Hard to Recycle Materials, however, um, was closed to the general public in compliance with the City of Boulder's emergency declaration. Um, so no residential materials have been accepted at our facility for quite some time now, but 
I just wanted to mention that we are working to try to get this facility reopened as soon as possible because we know that a lot of folks have hard to recycle materials that are, are building up and we're doing the best we can to get that up and running again. And there um, is a possibility that we are going to be able to reopen as soon as this coming Monday, um, but stay tuned for details on that. So we're, we're still working all that kind of stuff out, but we'll make sure to let people know once we know. Um, obviously still working out ways to make sure that our um, employees at the charm are safe um, and protected as well as our customers. Um, so we're figuring out that process and then we'll keep you updated on that. Okay, thanks Ari. Uh, la 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 la. Um, what else? Um, do you process plastic lids? So we talked about that a little bit. So plastic lids, if they can go on a plastic thing, like a little plastic cap on a water bottle, um, make sure it's t attached to <laughs> the plastic uh, container and then it can go through together. And then a yogurt lid can actually go through, it's uh, like a tub lid, not necessarily yogurt, um, like you know hummus or whatever you have, that yogurt lid or that <laughs> tub lid that like snaps on. In Boulder County, that can go through um, by itself um, now. So in the past, we just sorted plastics exclusively by hand. So we were like bottle, tub, jug, we're just trying to throw things around and um, our sorters wear really big gloves to protect them from all the <laughs> stuff that people put in that are uh, dangerous. Um, not to mention just because it's dirty. Um, and so before we couldn't grab a tub lid with our big gloved hands um, and throw it anywhere uh, because it's all on a conveyor belt moving quickly past you. And now that we sort um, plastics by lasers, optical sorters, we can like shoot them off the conveyor belt using a little puff of air. So um, here in Boulder County, you can put small plastic um, lids attached to um, uh, plastic containers. And if they're bigger than two inches, they can go through by themselves. Um, let's see. I found one, Rosie. Yes. If you're ready. Um, Beth Parton asks, can brightly dyed papers be recycled or is that like putting non-color, colorful, that fit, non-color fast fabric into the laundry <laughs> such a good question yes so um yeah brightly colored paper um so like neon construction paper um is a problem in paper recycling um if it is that color or it's super dark so if it's like a super dark color as well bright or dark um it's a problem in the paper recycling if it's that color all the way through so you can check if it's super heavily dyed by just tearing the piece of paper um, if it's white on the inside, then it's okay. Um, in the, that means that the dye is just kind of on the outside. Um, and if it's if it's that color all the way through, then that means it's a beater dye, B E A T E R. Um, and the the paper recyclers don't like the beater dye because, as you said, it's like a it's like a red sock in the white wash. Um, it's just super heavily dyed, and when they whip up the paper, um, it'll just bleed its color. So the best thing to do if you have neon um, or dark paper that's dyed all the way through is to compost it if you have access to a compost rather than recycle it. That's a great one. Um, let's see, someone said, I see the presentation is being recorded. Will it be available to us later? Yes, um, I will send it out to um, everyone who's registered and you can send it to people who forgot to register. And someone also asked if they could share on Facebook. Um, and it's currently being streamed live on Facebook. So as soon as we end the call, that video will, that live video will turn into a post. So you can just go straight to the EcoCycle Facebook page, hit share and share with all your friends. Share with your friends. Um, somebody said, do grocery stores really, really recycle the plastic bags? I see people use the bins, but I'm skeptical. That's a great question. So um, what we're referring to here is those plastic bag and stretchy film um, recycling collections that you see. We have one at the Charm at the Center for Hard to Recycle Materials. Um, and then a lot of, um, whoa, my cat just fell off my lap. Um, we have 
uh, a lot of grocery stores have a similar color. <laughs> She's rubbing her face on the computer. Um, a lot of grocery stores also have a plastic bag recycling collection. So the type that you can, um, that you can recycle is a number four LDPE, sometimes a number two HDPE plastic bag. So it's just a stretchy plastic bag um, or film. Uh, and what happens to it is it gets, there's a market for it um, with Trex decking. So T-R-E-X is that um, type of like plasticky, like composite decking. And so that's what plastic bags can get turned into. So I can vouch <laughs> that um, at um, the charm, we sure do recycle them. I think it is healthy to have an, uh, a little skepticism, especially when there's kind of public um, collections of hard to recycle materials like electronics, for example, I'm always, always pretty skeptical of um, when it's outside the charm or other kind of verified um, collection sites. Uh, for plastic bags, I mean, I can't, I can't say for every store, but in the case of plastic bags, because they, they're not, they don't have to pay to dispose of them, they can actually get money by selling them. Um, I would trust a plastic bag collection a little more than I would trust something like an electronics collection for recycling. Um, so I can't, <laughs> can't speak for every store there. Um, I can speak for the charm, but um, I would trust something like a plastic bag or a scrap metal collection more than other hard to recycle materials because they have the opportunity to get um, paid for those materials. <sighs> if not, I have one for you. Okay. Okay. Um, it's a uh, Sandra asks. You talk a lot. Uh, you talk about recycling in Boulder County. Does all recycling in Boulder County go to you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yep. So <laughs> yes, uh, we have all sorts of different haulers. So like you know, my truck at my house says Republic on it. Yours might say Western or Waste Management. Um, but all of those trucks, uh, whether you're in a business or a multifamily complex or a home, are bringing your recyclables to the Boulder County Recycling Center, uh, where EcoCycle staff is um, sorting through it. So if you're somewhere like Broomfield or Denver or somewhere like that, uh, it's not necessarily coming to us, but in Boulder County, we'll get it. We'll get your stuff. Um, I did want to plug also, I know we're winding down, um, I did want to plug our video series. So we're making, since we're all working from home and we still want to do our recycling outreach, um, we want to, um, what was I just talking about? <laughs> wow. <laughs> just like blacked out for a second. Our, uh, we are making a video series about zero waste. So each video uh, covers a different topic. Our first one actually covers what I just talked about. Like, where does our stuff come from? It's a lot less detail, um, but um, each, each week is gonna be a different topic. And you can sign up at ecocycle.org slash videos, and I will send you that link, um, again, in that follow-up email that I'll send everyone. It's all just one email, I won't send you a bunch. <laughs> I'll just send it in one. Um, but so uh, stay tuned for that, because um, there's still a lot more video content to come if you're curious about stuff like the stuff that was covered in this webinar. And something that's cool that goes along with the videos is there are activities, um, multiple activities for different age ranges. So something for each part of the family to do. We knew that during this time, a lot of folks are at home with their kids and trying to find something to do to help them get engaged and learn more in a fun way. Um, so we've kind of set up some activities that will go along with every video. And it's also available, going to be available in Spanish. So if you have any Spanish speakers who would like to, who do not speak English, um, we also have an option for them as well. Yeah. Um, Katrina says, how many times can different things be up or down recycled? Um, so glass and aluminum are our infinite friends. So as long as we keep recycling them, they're not losing value. They can just keep getting turned back into their old selves <laughs> over and over again, um, which is a great argument for recycling those things. Paper, like I said, is, is more like five to seven times. Um, and so it's not infinite because um, every time we recycle paper, it goes through that smoothie that I keep talking about, that big like paper blender. Um, and the fibers 
um, get shorter and shorter. And so that, that thing gets less and less durable or yeah, less and less durable. So, you know, it could start out as something like cardstock and then end up as something like, you know, paper towel, a low grade paper, um, which if it ends up as something like that could get composted at the end. Um, and then plastic is usually more like one, one to two times. So, you know, like I said, um, uh, a bottle, your number one bottle could get turned into you know, a carpet and then go to the landfill. You know, your number two gets turned into a bench and then that goes to landfill. Um, it's usually not, not a whole lot of times. Um, cool. La, 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 la. Can we recycle? Hi, Coco. I was just thinking about you the other day. Coco makes um, amazing chocolates. So keep an eye out for that. Um, she said, can we recycle even small metal bottle caps? Um, this one uh, is something that <laughs> has changed. Um, so a bottle cap, because it's smaller than two inches, it's going to likely fall through that um, glass crack that I talked about, that fine screen. And that's why we don't typically want um, things that are smaller than two inches to go through the recycling by itself. Um, but in the case of bottle caps, now we're getting pretty good at, um, we, all the stuff that falls through the fine screen, so glass and then all, you know, the paper shred and stuff like that, um, we pass it under a magnet to try to get stuff uh, that doesn't, that's not glass out of there. And we're getting pretty good at getting those bottle caps out. Um, so the best thing to do with bottle caps is actually to recycle them as scrap metal. So if you have, like, the, if you can come to the charm, don't just, like, drive to the charm to give us one bottle cap. But like, if you have a, a jar in your kitchen, you can like keep them and then take them next time you go to the charm or, you know, Longmont has a waste diversion center um, with scrap metal. So that's the best thing um, to do uh, if you want to make sure that it gets recycled as scrap metal. Um, but otherwise we're getting pretty good at, um, at getting that metal cap out of the glass stream here at Boulder Recycling or the Boulder County Recycling Center. Um, okay, this says, is it true, Bella says, is it true that the recycling numbers on the bottom of plastics can lie to convince consumers that they are recyclable when they're actually not? Um, so like I said, um, uh, it's mostly the recycling symbol that is kind of more the greenwashing. So, um, the, the number on the bottom is meaningful and it is accurate. It just means, um, you know, if I look on the bottom of my hummus container, it's going to say a five because that's the resin number for polypropylene, which is what my hummus container is likely made of. So it's really more of like a, an, a within the industry kind of thing. So like if I'm in the plastics industry, I'm going to know what a number five is, but like you as a consumer is not necessarily going to look at your five and be like, oh, it's polypropylene just as I suspected. Now I know what to do with it. Um, so the recycling symbol though, that chasing arrows symbol, um, yeah, <laughs> you could argue that that's a form of greenwashing um, to, to convince consumers that it's recyclable even when it's not. So um, first of all, like I said, that, that um, chasing error symbol is unregulated and anyone can really put it on whatever they want. It doesn't <laughs> have to prove that it's recyclable. Um, but also, even if that thing is recyclable and the, the producer thinks that it's recyclable, um, it's not necessarily recyclable everywhere. So, you know, if I have my hummus container, my hummus container doesn't know whether I'm in, you know, Boulder or Indonesia. Like, it, you know, it can't tell <laughs> your recycling guidelines. So even if the producer wants you to know that where they live, it's recyclable, it's not necessarily recyclable in your area. Um, and so <laughs> rather than uh, talk about the numbers or the symbols or anything like that here in Boulder County, we communicate our... Um, recycling guidelines just based on like literally what is it so bottles tubs jugs jars clamshells to go containers pill bottles and tub lids um are our basic guidelines and if it's one of those things you don't have to worry about the symbol and you don't have to worry about the number you can put it in the recycling bin but again check with your local recycler and we actually um in uh, on our ecocycle website ecocycle.org we have a pocket guide to plastics which is really useful um and it's just kind of even if um the numbers don't necessarily tell you <laughs> whether something's recyclable it is really cool as a consumer if you're interested in this kind of thing to learn more about what number is what plastic like which ones are more toxic which ones are more generally recyclable um things like that because um, there is a correlation in the bigger numbers 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's recyclable. This one just says, why is recycling so hard? Yeah, it was what I just said. <laughs> That's the answer to that. <laughs> it is hard. And it's, yeah, I mean, when we get that feedback, like, especially with plastics, like, why is plastics recycling so hard? We're like, I know. I agree. Like, we didn't make those plastic items. We wish that we didn't have to deal with them at all. And we wish that it didn't salve the recycling symbol on it, but here we are. So I think it goes back to the producer responsibility. Like, <laughs> we just need to make, like, we need to stop making everything out of all these different materials and start to think about the recyclability of our packaging before we make it, rather than having it fall on the recycler to communicate and then the consumer to figure out what our communication means. Um, so we need more uniform packaging and we need packaging to be um, designed specifically to fit our current infrastructure. Okay. Cool. Oh. We just have a couple minutes left, Rosie. Uh, yeah. Oh, um, approximately three. So I'd say cool. let's pick one more. La, 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 la. This one's super quick. What are EPR laws? That's what I talked about. Um, I had a slide that said EPR. It just, it stands for extended producer responsibility. So it means that if I make a product, I am financially <laughs> responsible for it from when I make it to when it is disposed of. So like if I make electronics, I, I the producer pay for its ultimate disposal because right now that cost falls on the producer. I mean, on the consumer, but it should fall on the producer. La, 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 la. Um, let's see, all of these, yeah, we only have a few more minutes. Um, if you have burning questions, you can send them to me. I know I haven't covered them all. There's a lot of them, a lot of really great questions. Uh, we did that one, done. Um, let's see. Huh. Is, bio ew, is biodegradable plastic the way to go? I feel like it's confusing. It is confusing. You're right. <laughs> so <laughs> biodegradable is another term that is often associated with greenwashing because you can just say it about whatever you want. Basically, like really anything is, I mean, biodegradable just means it'll break down over time. So like, I, like anything really is biodegradable. I mean, if you're given enough time. Um, and so a lot of times if you see the word biodegradable specifically on a plastic product, it means that that plastic um, usually has an additive in it to make it break down into microplastics even quicker than it would otherwise. Microplastics are those tiny, tiny little pieces of plastic that get into our water and our air and our lungs and our fish and ugh. Um, and so that's a negative thing. Turning into microplastics is a bad thing. Um, so biodegradable generally don't, don't read into that um, as a good thing. Uh, my greenwashing flag goes up when I see the word biodegradable. What you want to look for is BPI certified compostable. That means that it's a PLA compostable plastic um, that can be put in your compost. And if it just says biodegradable, it's usually petroleum that's just going to break down into microplastics in a bad way. Um, yeah, OMG. Gross. Okay, well, that's pretty much it. I know I didn't answer all the questions, but I can, um, I can type them up <laughs> and try my best to answer them and send them in a, um, in a follow-up email at the end, um, as along with all the other info that I said that I would um, send to you guys. So thank you all so much again for um, tuning in. Um, feel free to watch this video <laughs> and share it um, on Facebook if you missed it or want to share it with someone. Um, and expect a follow-up email if you registered. Thank you so much and happy Earth Day to you all. I hope you're all staying safe and healthy.